what a privilege it is uh, to be here this morning. I, I'm so excited to have an opportunity to share God's word with you. But I want to start out with a question today. And the question is this, by show of hands, how many of you in here like change? So you like things to be different. You like new things, different things. You like change. Go ahead, lift your hand. If you like change in your life, go ahead and lift your hand up. Okay, not very many of you. Okay, so then let's try the other one. How many of you dislike change? So you like routine, you like to know what to expect, you like, how many of you don't like to raise your hand? <laughs> okay, I knew I'd get the rest of you at, at one point. You know, I, I, I am a person, I like change. I don't know why, but I've always been that way. In fact, I probably would say I love change. I was always that kid who, who had to rearrange his room every month. I wanted it to look different. If, yeah, I wanted it to look different and feel different. Or I would walk to school different ways each day. Um, I, I love having rooms. I love painting rooms different colors, maybe in the house. Or let me, let me actually rephrase that. I love having rooms in my house painted different colors. I actually hate painting. I despise it. If you want to come over and have some therapy and paint my house, you can do that. But I love having my house painted different colors. I love different cars. I like the idea of moving into a different house or a different neighborhood, but I love change. And I don't know if it's, you know, the, the opportunity to experience something new, or maybe it's, it's to experience something fresh, but I love change. But as I started really thinking about it, I realized this, that no matter how much I love change, and I'm a person of change, no matter how much I love change, I realize there are things in my life where I don't, for whatever reason. Take Red Robin, for instance. I love Red Robin. I love Red Robin. And Red Robin gets a lot of my money, and, and, and I'm not sponsored by Red Robin, but I should be. Um, <laughs> because I give them enough, you know, I take care of them. But anyway, I love Red Robin. And every time I'm heading to Red Robin, I think to myself, I go, I'm going to get something different today. I'm going to get something different. And maybe I'll try chicken or maybe a salad or something like that, right? They got good salads or cool chicken sandwiches. And I even get to the restaurant. I even grab the menu. And every time I read the menu, I know it by heart, but every time I read the menu as though, man, this time is going to be different. And I look through the menu and I'm all intent and I'm thinking this or this. And then every time the server comes to my table, almost involuntarily, I shout out, I'll have the Mad Love Burger as pink as they'll make it. Every single time. The Mad Love Burger as pink as they'll make it. And then everyone's looking at me like, hey, I thought you were going to try. I'm like, yeah, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. And, and, and I don't know why. I don't know. You know, if you've never had the Mad Love Burger, go. Just tell them Danny sent you. They'll, they'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, the Mad Love. But go, and it's got this cool, like, Parmesan crisp, and, and these. it's just awesome. But I don't know if it's like that thing in me that goes, I know that when I get this, I'm happy. You know, I know that I'm always, I'm full when I, when I eat the Mad Love Burger. I leave being fulfilled. But for whatever it is, as much as I want to change in that area, I just can't. But the reality is, this is how most of us are, right? There are areas of our life where we like change, especially if that change brings about something really good. Like, we'll welcome that change because it brings something really good. But then there's other areas where we don't like change because we're not sure of the outcome or, or it's not worth the risk that it poses to us. And we don't like risk or we don't like change. The title of today's message is exactly what we're looking at about being changed. The title of today's message is, We Are Changed by God. And we're going to look at how we can be changed by God. But before we go any further, let's pray. Father, I really pray. I pray that you would come and meet us where we're at today. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. God, I pray that you would minister to our souls today. Lord, I pray that there would be in no way the case where I would get in the way of your words this morning. But Father, that you would speak to us, that we would hear your voice, and we would be different because we encountered you today. We love you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles or your devices, your phones, whatever it might be, go ahead and open up to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And that's the, Peter, or the, the passage um, that is the crux of our series today. But last week we started our new series called Chosen. 
and you're here, second week in a row. So congratulations, you are a third of the way done. Right, last week, Pastor Bruce encouraged us, let's make sure we're there all the weeks, and you're a third of the way done, so congratulations on that. But we started our new series called Chosen, where we're answering this basic question, who are we? Why are we here? And we're talking all about our identity, and we're looking at the words that Peter wrote in the book that we know of as 1 Peter. And there are these words that he wrote as an encouragement to Christians, where he's constantly reminding them and ultimately us of our identity. Not only who we are, but whose we are and what that really means for us. So let's go ahead and read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says this, he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So last week, Pastor Bruce reminded us that we were chosen by God, that he picked us, that we're not stuck with, that he's not stuck with us, right? He reminded us that we are not our own, that we are his. And so Peter in this passage says, you are a chosen people, royal priests. And then our focus today is that we are a holy nation, that he says that we are a holy people. In fact, he says that about you, that you are a holy person. He says it about me, that I am a holy person. And so it's important that when we're hearing his words, when he's declaring that truth over you, that you are a holy people, what does he mean? What does the word holy mean? The word holy simply means set apart. The word holy means dedicated to God. It means to be consecrated or even to be made sacred. And so Peter was saying that as followers of Jesus, you are different than the rest of the world. You are not who you used to be, right? That once you chose to follow Jesus, you were no longer the same, but you have been changed by God, given a new identity. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5.17, the apostle Paul calls us a new creation. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And so who are you? You are changed by God. You are a new creation and you are holy. But I know what you're probably thinking. Pastor, those are, those are good church words, right? That's an awesome Sunday school phrase, right, that, that we're holy, that we're holy, that we're made holy, that we've been declared holy, but I'm pretty sure I'm not holy, right? I, I see the way I live. I see the things I do, and you're probably thinking, man, you can ask my wife. She'll tell you I'm not holy, right? You can ask my roommate or my, my classmate or, or my best friend. They're all going to testify to the fact that I am not who my dog thinks I am, right? <laughs> I didn't make that up. I actually saw that on a church bulletin board, and I was like, I've got to work that in to the message, and I did. But you're thinking, man, I, I know me. I am not holy, and you might even be thinking, man, I've been following Christ for so long. For some of you, it's only been a couple months, but for others, it's been 20, 30 years, and you're going, and I have yet to experience the fullness of being holy to, to experience this life change that the Bible talks about. And so you're going, I love the idea of being holy. And if that's true, I want to experience it. But the reality is we forget that we have been made new. We forget that we are a new creation. We forget that our new identity is that we are holy. Check this out. You have not just been freed from the penalty of your sin but you have been freed from the power of sin. Did you hear that? I think we get the reality that we're free from the penalty of sin, right? We understand. We place our faith in Jesus, and the penalty is gone. That Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again to, to take care of the penalty of our sin. That one day, we're going to stand before God, and he's going to say, I see you as perfect. I see you as the penalty has already been paid. Your debt has been paid. We get that part, that we've been freed from the penalty of sin. But we forget that we have also been freed from the power of sin. Romans 6, 6 says we are no longer slaves to sin. What does that mean? It means this. We don't have to be who we once were. 
You don't have to be who you once were. So what do we need to do to experience this freedom from sin? How can we experience this real life change this side of heaven? And there's two truths I want to look into this morning. And the first one is this. Life change happens in relationship, not in rules and rituals. Life change happens, if, if you're writing this down, that's really good. You should have all been writing it down. But life change happens in relationship, not in rules and rituals. So when it comes to being changed by God, when it comes to being holy, it's all about relationship, not rules. So turn over one page if you're in your Bible or scroll over in your phone to 1 Peter. We're going to look at his words a little earlier in this letter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. And Peter says this, the one who just reminded us that we... We're holy. But 1 Peter 1.15 says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Be holy because I am holy. Listen, we have been made holy positionally. This is who we are. We have a new identity. We are a new creation in Christ. We were once an orphan, but now we are a child of God. Positionally, we have changed, but we've also been commanded to live holy practically. And this is speaking to what we do, how we live. But we hear that. And we can easily get things messed up where we begin to believe Christianity is all about rules, right? Making it about doing all the right things and not doing all the wrong things and believing that God just wants us to do everything right. And we have this tendency to turn Christianity into a self-help plan or a self-improvement plan. We believe that if we just have enough quiet times throughout the week and, and if I go to church just enough, If I give God just enough of my money, then somehow I'm going to be good. And we make it about rules. We look at Christianity as though it's some moral code where we try to manage our sin, where we try to follow these set of rules. But the reality is it is about a relationship. It is not about rules. I love, I love what God says in verse 16. And there's a lot of ways or a lot of things we can extrapolate from this passage, but I want to look at one quick thing. In verse 16, he says, For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. He says, Be holy because I am holy. What is he saying? He's saying, Become like me. Become like me. And I want you to understand the invitation here. We often hear this as a command, and it is a command, but we often hear it as though this is like some God going, bam, bam, but it's not. It's an invitation to become like Jesus himself. So it is a command, but an invitation, and what he's saying is this, is that if because I am holy, when you're near me, when you get close to me, when you live in community with me, just by being with me, you are able to, and you will want to become holy. That's what happens in relationship. And so the more we grow in our relationship with Jesus, the more he grows us from the inside out. Check this out. You can't become like him, though, if you don't spend time with him. Did you hear that? I mean, that is a fact. You can't become like him if you don't spend time with him. Do you realize that you become like who or what you hang around with most. Did you catch that? You become like who or what you hang around with most. As I was researching for this message and going through commentaries and going online, going, yeah, what does the world say about being changed and what is this and just trying to understand different things, I kept coming across all these life coaches that all seem to be saying the same thing. And these are all just secular life coaches. They're not basing anything on Scripture, but they all said this, and I just took one of their quotes, but they all were saying the same thing. But this one guy said it like this. He said, you become like those you spend the most time with. If you spend a great deal of time with someone on a daily basis, acquiring their habits is inevitable. You will become like them. If you spend enough time with someone on a daily basis, it is inevitable that you will acquire their habits, that you will become like them. You know, when I was in uh, fourth grade, I had a friend named Jeffrey. 
And I think we all had friends named Jeffrey because it's just a little kid name. But I'm 10 years old, and, and Jeffrey was one of my, my best buds, man. We spent so much time together. We played every recess together, every lunch together. We got in trouble together. We did good things together, bad things together. It was just normal 10-year-old stuff. But I loved Jeffrey, and I loved being around Jeffrey. But Jeffrey had kind of this weird thing. Jeffrey was what I called a blinker. He was a blinker. Now you're going, what is a blinker? A blinker is someone who blinks a lot. And when I'm saying Jeffrey blinked a lot, like he blinked a lot. Like his eyes blinked more than like a hummingbird's wings. Like Jeffrey, I don't know, I don't know why, but like you just looked at Jeffrey and his eyes were moving more than they were ever open or closed. And so it was, uh, but I love Jeffrey, but I, I made fun of Jeffrey, but not, it, not to his face because I'm not mean. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it was, thank you. Okay, I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud of that. I'm not. I'm not. But I mean, it was so bad that you would make fun. You're like, that's a little weird. But I like Jeffrey anyway. But one day, one day I'm in class and a friend leans over to me. And I'm sure he didn't say it like this because we were 10. So I don't remember how he said it. But he's like, hey, Danny. And I was like, what? And he says, hey, why are you blinking so much? And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, why are you blinking so much? I was like, I'm not blinking. I'm not blinking, you know, and then I go home, and that week, my mom literally starts going, she probably doesn't even remember, because to her, it wasn't a big deal, but to me, this was like mortifying, right, that was morphing into a blinker, right, and so my mom's like, what, honey, why are you blinking so much, like, do we need to test you for a disorder or whatever, and I'm in class, and the teacher's like, hey, Danny, do you need to sit closer to the board, like, is something wrong with your eyes, and I began this journey, because I realized that somehow I'd picked up Jeffrey's weird blinking habit, and I'd become the weird blinker in the class, and so now, I began this journey of going, okay, like, I'm not going to blink ever again, you know? <laughs> and then they're like, hey, Danny, why are you that weird big-eyed kid? <laughs> you know, it just sucked. It wasn't good. But the reality is this. As dumb as that sounds, it is so true. We become like that which we hang out and spend the most time with. See, these life coaches are right. They're right. But their idea is not new or novel. In fact, long before, 2,000 years before these life coaches ever mentioned this, ever mentioned it, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says this, and it'll be up. He said, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. What is he saying? You're going to become like that which you hang around with the most. Bad company corrupts good character. And the opposite is absolutely true as well. Keeping company with God creates good character. Being with God, being close to God, spending the most time with God creates in us not just a positional holiness, but a practical holiness as well. So let me ask a question. Why do we think we can spend just a few minutes with God and become like him? Why do we think we can spend just a few minutes with God and experience the benefits of being in relationship with God? You know, it's kind of scary to think that we often have a better relationship with Netflix or Hulu or Amazon or sports radio or fiction novels or gossiping with our friends. We often have a better relationship. We spend more time with those things, allowing them to impact us than we ever do with God. But the reality is this. God saved you for a relationship with you. He longs to be with you. He longs to give you everything that you need within the context of relationship with him. So we need to talk to him. We need to spend time with him. We need to be in his word. And we need to listen to his words. And we need to worship him. And we need to talk about him to others. We need to be in this deep relationship with him. And in doing so, he will change us. He will change you. You know, that's why this spiritual growth campaign is so important to us. You know, we just believe in our core as pastors that if we will spend daily time with God, we will be changed. We're all going through this chosen devotional. If you haven't grabbed it yet, go get it. But I want to tell you, there's nothing special about this book, but there's something inherently special about the time we spend with God while going through a book like this. 
And so we believe that, that, that if we spend daily time with God, and if we're at church every single week, not, not periodically, but if we're at church every single week where we're hearing God's message and we're, we're availing ourselves to the things God wants to tell us, and if we're in a life group where we're talking about Jesus and we're talking about how we can apply his truths to our lives, we believe we will be changed forever, forever, and we will experience the fullness of of being changed by God in a relationship with Him. You know, we have a worship concert. I know Pastor Bruce talked about it a few minutes ago. Worship night coming up October 15th. And it's going to be an awesome night of just connecting and communing with God in intimacy. And I want you to know, this is not a night designed to entertain you. And it's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. And there's going to be a lot of energy. And the lights will be really cool. And the music will be loud. And it's going to be these great moments of intimacy. We're going to have Keenan rap again. So if you didn't hear Keenan or you want to hear Ke- yeah, you can applaud Keenan. I love Keenan, by the way. You guys love Keenan? Yeah. But Keenan's going to rap. So even though the night's going to be awesome, it's not designed to entertain anybody. It's designed to create an atmosphere where you will be able to intimately connect with God at a deeper level in a way you can't do on a Sunday morning. It's designed to give you time to deepen your relationship with God. So come out and worship with us. But listen, God is good. He's loving. He's kind. He is so filled with truth and he's quick to forgive. And he's the source of peace. He's the source of hope. He's the source of joy. And he is holy. And just by being near him, he changes us from the inside out. Starting with our heart, not our actions, we begin to change. We are holy because God is holy. What an amazing invitation. The second truth I want to look at today is this. Life change happens when I kill my old self. Life change happens when I kill my old self. And I know that probably sounds intense. It should sound intense because it is. Life change happens when I kill my old self. Listen to to, to Peter's words in 1 Peter. We're going to go back a verse. In verse 14, he says this. He says, as obedient children, you and I, Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Peter said, don't conform to the evil desires you had before you knew Christ. And the apostle Paul even takes it further in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. And he says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. What is the Apostle Paul saying? He's saying that he's put to death his old self. He says, basically, my old self, the person I used to be, it's been nailed to a cross. The person I was before I knew Jesus, the things I did before I knew Jesus, they've all been crucified. That person is dead. Those deeds are gone. That's what the Apostle Paul says. And then he goes on to say, but it's no longer I who live now, but Christ in me. Listen. He says, because of Jesus, I am a new person, a new creation. I am not just an improved human being, but because of Jesus, I am truly changed by God. So what is Paul really saying? He's saying you cannot add a little bit of God to your life. He must become your life. I think somehow we get this all messed up. We come to faith in Jesus and we think we can just sprinkle a little bit of God pixie dust over our life and then something's going to change in us. But he's saying you can't just add a little bit of God. You can't just do a little quiet time or go to church. You can't just add a little God to your life and and, and, and expect to experience everything he has for you. But you have to make him our life. It is all or nothing. You know, I tend to be an all or nothing guy. It's my personality. I don't know why. It's how how God made me. If you spend any time with me, you're like, oh, man, there are times when I love that about him and times when I don't. And that's very true, but it's okay. It's it's who I am. But I'm not great with moderation. And, you know, I kind of grew up a pudgy kid. Um, I grew up a pudgy kid, and so I was always looking for, like, diet things that would work for me. and, and, And Sherry and I would look for diets and try these different things. But one day, 
One day I was probably about like 40 pounds overweight, and I was like, I got to do something. Well, I came across keto. Anybody hear keto? Keto is this, this awesome diet. Like I, all of a sudden I was like, man, all I have to do is cut carbs out of my diet, and, and I'll get stronger and lose weight. Okay, I'm in. Literally, like all I have to do is load up on fat and protein, and like somehow I'm going to lose weight. And it's exactly what happened for me. And I don't know, something switched in my mind. I love bread. I love it. Passionately love bread. But bread comes across. I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm on keto. You know, I don't need bread. Ice cream? No, I'm on keto. I'm good. There's cake at birthday parties? Nope. I'm on keto. I don't need cereal. Cereal is like my kryptonite. You know, I love cereal. But I'm like, I'm not going to touch that stuff. I'm on keto. The, the staff asked me back in May, hey, do you want uh, uh, banana cream pie for your birthday? I, I love banana cream pie. But if you're ever going to bring it to me, just call me first. Go, hey, are you on keto? Because if I'm on keto, I won't touch it. Because something happens to me. Like my whole mindset changes. It becomes all or nothing. But listen to this. And it's a big but. And it leads to an even bigger but if you know what I'm saying, the, the moment, the moment, like, I get into, like, maintenance mode. I don't know what it is. Like, okay, I've lost the weight. I kind of look maybe a little bit like I want to look. And I go, now I'm just going to add a few carbs to my diet, you know. Just add a few. I'll have just a little bit of ice cream. I'll just a little bit of bread. I just begin. In a week, I'm still like, okay, I'm good. Week two, it's kind of like falling off. By week three, the wheels are completely off the thing, and I'm eating every single thing I see. Every single, I mean, I'm now eating, and that's where I'm at right now. I'm now, I'm eating like loaves of bread, like it's the last loaf I'm ever going to see. <laughs> I don't know why, but I'm like, okay, butter it, salt it, you know, I'm just eating it down. Ice cream, no joke. Like I sit at night, everyone's in bed, and I'm like, I just pull it out, eat it right out of the container. Because I'm like, I can. I'm not on keto. I can eat whatever I want. Cereal? Don't judge me. But I, at night, everyone's in bed. It's like 1 in the morning. I pour myself this big bowl. Sherry doesn't even know this. Hi, Sherry. It's my wife. <laughs> I pull this, pour this big bowl of cereal, fill it up to the top, load it with milk. I eat the whole thing, and all the cereal's gone, but there's still milk, right? You can't waste milk. That would be sinful. So I pour more cereal in, <laughs> and I eat that down. And then there's still some milk, so I pour more. And by that time, half the box of Frosted Flakes are gone. Sherry comes out the next morning going, I thought I just bought it. I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry, honey. I'm not on keto anymore. You know, I don't, I don't know what you want me to do. But having my mind in those two different worlds, it doesn't work for me. It just doesn't work. It needs to be all or nothing for me. But I think it's the same thing with us becoming like Christ. It's the exact same thing. It's all or nothing. We can't just add a little bit of God to our life, but we must crucify our old self. There is no God maintenance plan. It is all or nothing. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, he says to put off your old self, who you once were, and put on your new self. He's talking about a wholesale change, not just adding some clothes to your old clothes, but completely changing them. To identify now as a new person, a changed person, a freed person, not as a prisoner of sin. You know, how silly would it be? You got a prisoner, a guy that's been in prison for 20 years, right? And in prison, he's wearing his, his orange jumpsuit, right? And, and shackles and these things. How silly would it be if that guy was freed? And as he's walking out, they're like, hey, here's your new clothes. And he was like, no, nah, I'm good. I look great in the orange, right? <laughs> He wouldn't do that. He'd be like, get these off of me. Like, this represents who I used to be. I don't want these clothes anymore. I don't want to be who I was. Take these things off, man. I'm putting on the clothes of a freed man because that's who I want to be. That's what it means to put off the old self and on the new self. To not just put it away, but to crucify it. So how do we do this? Practically speaking, how do we do this? We begin by telling Jesus that we're sold out for him. Not, hey, I accepted you, I'll see you when I get there. But saying, Jesus, I am sold out. I am a fully devoted follower of you. And we begin by telling him that, and then we say, God, if there's anything in my life that's not pleasing to you, show it to me, reveal it to me, help me leave it behind and kill it. 
starting with my soul. God, if there's any lies I'm believing, if there's anything I'm holding on to, if there's anything I am doing in my life that I think is okay, but it is not, root it out because that's who I used to be not who I am any longer. Help me kill these things. Instead of being a bitter person, help me be a giver of grace. Instead of being this prideful, self-centered person, that's who I used to be, God. But would you help me be someone that puts you first and puts others second? Instead of, instead of being this liar or a gossip or crude, you go, no, 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 I don't want that, but I want to use my words to build life into people. Instead, God, of finding intimacy outside of marriage, whether it's with a person or pornography, no, God, that's who I used to be. Help me find intimacy with you and you alone. Listen, we are changed by God when we partner with God to kill our old self. We are changed by God when we work with God to kill our old self. So in conclusion, I ask one more time, who are we? The answer is this, we are changed by God. We are new people, not modified people, but new people. And I want you to hear this, the process is incredibly simple. It is. It's not hidden. It's not available for some and not for others. It's not some some thing that we have to pilgrimage to go find out. No, the process has been made very plain to us. It's simple, but the reality is it's not easy. And we know that. It's not easy. See, if it's about relationship and not rules, then we need to get ourselves close to Jesus. We need to be in the Word. We need to be in church. We need to be in groups and in youth groups. We need to be worshiping, not just on Sunday mornings, but in our cars. In our homes, we need to be worshiping, and really we need to be doing anything and everything we can to be close to Jesus. But it's hard. It's difficult. Why? Because our schedules are busy. Our kids are crazy, right? We've got distractions at every turn. But the reality is, it's worth it. It's worth it. And if it's about killing our old self, if it's about putting away our old thoughts and our old patterns, then understand that old self is going to come back fighting. That old self doesn't want to go away, right? So you're going to have old friends that show up. You're going to have old shows that come begging for you to watch them. You're going to have old bottles coming to to, to be drank. You're going to have old temptations popping up everywhere you go and everywhere you turn. It is not easy. Your role might even be a little painful in that process, but it is worth it. Growth costs, but it is worth it. I want to ask one last question. Anyone in here have a gym membership? Anyone in here have a gym membership? And by the way, as a worship pastor, my job is just to teach you how to raise your hand, so um, that's why why I'm doing this a lot, just to get everyone used to this. But um, yeah, gym membership. Do you realize that 67% of gym memberships, the people who pay for them never go to the gym one time. In fact, that's the whole business model of the gym. Sell more memberships than you can ever put people in. That's how they make their money. Well, I was a part of that for like a year and a half, right? A year and a half, I have this gym membership and I didn't go and Sherry's like, hey, honey, should we cancel the gym membership? I'm like, no, I think we should be donating to Vasa. You know, I feel really, feel really bad, you know? I feel really bad for him, so, you know, and she's like, yeah, but are you going to go? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to the gym, you know, let's not get rid of my membership. She's like, okay, that's fine. But there was something about me that was like, it just kind of felt good being a gym member, you know. It kind of just felt good knowing that when I'm ready, it's there. You know what I'm saying? But what happens is even though we're a member of a gym, we miss out on all the benefits that come with being a member of a gym because we don't go and do our part. We miss out on the benefits of the gym. And the same is true with us in our walk with God. I think sometimes we can be so satisfied with simply being church members, members of God's church. We can be satisfied that that we carry the title Christian. We're kind of satisfied, it's fine, and, and I know he's there, 
I know I can go when I'm ready, but we're satisfied. We have enough. You've given me entrance into eternity. That's okay. I know you're there. But we become so easily satisfied that we miss out on the benefits of being in a relationship with God. We miss out on all that he has for us. See, God wants to change you, but you have to do your part. It's the small part. It's the easy part. I know you, you know me, you're not easy to change, but that's what God has said he is going to do. And while it's not easy, it is worth it. A life walked in closeness with God is better than anything you will ever find on your own, ever. Lastly, understand this, being changed by God doesn't mean we won't sin. It simply means we don't have to. Do you understand that? Being changed by God doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean you won't sin. It just means that sin no longer has rule over you. You're not a slave to sin. You are not who you once were. Even though we might sin, we don't have to. We have a new identity. We have been changed. He didn't just make you better. He made you new. So will you choose today to do whatever you can to enter into a new a newly defined relationship with Jesus, one where you're not just saved, but one where you walk closely with him, where you talk with him, and you view your relationship with Jesus not as a ritual, but as an opportunity. And then will you choose today to allow God to help you kill your old self, to put that off and to put on your new identity? Remember, you are not who the enemy says you are. You are not who you used to be. You are brand new. Will you step into that identity and let God change you and make you into everything he's destined you to be? Let's pray. Oh, Father, we, we're just so grateful to be your kids. We're so grateful, God, that, that you love us that you came to get us, that we matter to you, that you've chosen us. We're so grateful that we don't have to be perfect. We just have to be close to the one who is. Thank you for that. And God, today I pray that you would, you would just draw us into a deeper, more intimate relationship with you. And God, that beginning in this moment, forgetting what happened an hour ago, but beginning in this moment, that we will live by stepping into our new identity of being changed by God. We praise you today. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. When you came in this morning, you were given a communion cup. And if you didn't get one, we're going to take communion in a moment. You can feel free to walk in the back or you can just put your hand up. And, and Sean's back there. He can bring a communion cup over to you. But communion is a really cool opportunity to experience intimacy with Jesus. Jesus, the night he was betrayed, he said, he said when, we, when we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we're doing it in remembrance of me, re remembering what I am about to do, or when we do it, we remember what he's done. Not as a way of condemnation that I'm a mess, but in a way of celebrating that I am free, I am new. And so in a moment, we're gonna take communion together, but if you can pull this out, you can hold on to it just for a moment. And I wanna invite you, to just spend the next 30 seconds to a minute, two minutes, whatever it might be, and just go talk to God. And maybe for some, you're gonna say, you know what, I'm pretty far from you today, God. Help me come close. But just say, I want a new relationship with you. Take a moment and just do some business with the Lord this morning. Father, today we, we eat of the bread remembering that your body was broken for us. And we drink of the cup remembering that your blood was poured out for us, that all of our sins would be forgiven. That 
we could experience not just the power over death, but the power in life. Thank you. Church, today, let's flip it over and pull off the little lid. And there's a piece of bread in the bottom piece. And we'll pull that out. And we'll eat this in remembrance of his body that was broken for us. turn it over and the other side has juice in it and as we drink we're reminded that his blood has fixed everything for those who place their faith in him let's drink together